Hi, Thomas. How are you today? Hey, pretty good. Oh, lovely to chat with you. We chat very often on like LinkedIn, just re in regular life. So I have to say it's really weird to do it on a recording setting right now. But yeah, let's let's make it work. Yeah. But well, shoot, tell tell me what you got. Okay, let's get started. Uh, for those who don't know you, uh, please like tell us who you are and what you're working on. Yeah. So my name is Thomas Wilson. I have a background in CX, EX, UX, um, and uh, I've been a design director. I've been a strategy director. I've been a IC uh, contractor that does everything from strategy to service design and um, uh, human-centered design, mostly in healthcare uh, for the last 20 years, but I have done a lot also in in uh, higher learning and academia, and I've done uh, some other work in uh, banking and fintech and some other things, retail, but mostly healthcare and for the last 30 years. Jesus, 30 years. I know, it's a long time. I'm old. The world has changed a lot in 30 years, if you think about it. Like, let's yeah. just think about it for a second. Like, how many new technology, like, just thinking in technology, how much technology right. changed the field? The And the, there's been major shifts, right? So, the, the of course, there's the internet. <laughs> then there was the dot-coms. Then there was, and there's a lot of this stuff is, is American, you know, um, and that's like, you know, uh, the dot-com bubble, uh, you know, 9-11, the 2008 crisis, a lot of the stuff that happened with COVID, that was global. Um, the recession, that's happening all over the world, but it's hit really hard in the United States. Um, you know, all of that stuff is, uh, has been really big uh, shifts. And we're, we're in one right now, and that's the AI ML shift in you know, AI is, is actually really great for a lot of things in healthcare. I don't really support it, like the using chat GPT and LLMs and things like that to write your, your, your content for you or write for you, um, or, uh, illustrate or design things for you, but I 100% support you using it as a creative springboard or using it to help process, uh, things or in, in a chat and um and multimodal kind of a uh, uh, conversational design and also there's a lot of groundbreaking big breakthroughs that are happening in uh healthcare and oddly enough this the thing that you're doing that's going to the, the the UX conference in Germany some of my favorite folks that I follow in uh healthcare are in in AI and innovation in Germany and they uh, uh, several of them work for GE healthcare i think we had in our in our conference in amsterdam we had several speakers that spoke about ai and one of them was using ai to process um it it's a it's a company called i think my tomorrow and what they do is that they use an ai to scan through um clinical trials for patients with cancer because right they it's a it's a job that requires massive data processing capabilities and they compared to how much time it would take a doctor to look through all the clinical trials that are available and compare that to the needs of their patients and it was just fascinating like how these other uses for ai not in the sense of we're going to replace humans we're going to make sure that humans can use their capabilities in what is best for them which has is not this space it's not processing data so we are we have limits as humans it's like Let's use AI as a tool instead of a replacement, which I personally, that side I find fascinating. I'm not a, right. yeah, you know this about me. I am not the first one to jump on the AI boat, but me either. It's yeah. Critical thinking. I think like Dev, what Debbie Levitt says all the time, let's use critical thinking on this. Right. And she's a smart cookie. She knows her stuff. Uh, if you're familiar with um, some of the guys I was talking about, Matthias Goyen, He's mm -hmm. somebody you want to follow in Germany. He's really smart. Uh, Jan Bager. Uh, mm -hmm. And if I'm mispronouncing anybody's name because I'm a silly American, just forgive me. But Jan Bager is one of the guys I follow and I like it. And there's another guy named Thomas Hagemeyer. Um, so uh, all of those those three guys, and there's a hundred more. But I really like a lot of the things that they're saying because they're they're boldly going into 
this innovative and uncharted territory. And they're saying, hey, we can use it for this. We can use it for that. And the idea that and um, it just seems like in the States, we're overly concerned with making kitschy little illustrations and regurgitating other people's content and writing. That is just such a, a lame application for uh, AI and ML, and it kind of gives it a bad name. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's happening. But one of the things um, that's really important to think about, especially in healthcare all over the world, not, you know, this isn't just an American thing or a, or a UK thing, is understanding that most of these businesses are going to be platform based businesses, and they're going to need to have, they're going to need to have centralized data right? Because right now the biggest problem in healthcare, especially in the States, is these massive carriers or um, uh, uh, payers, insurance companies, right? Like United Healthcare, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Aetna, all of these, um, all of these companies, Cigna. The, the, thing that they're, the thing that they're all struggling with is they have disparate data and their data is, is siloed. And it's so the, the, the data that's coming from your app, that's your heart monitor or, you know, your glucose monitor that's on your arm, that stuff doesn't go into the same data portal or the same EMRs or the same things that, you know, other, uh, other stuff is going into. And so uh, the data is all disparate and it's all over the place. And if we want to really use AI to its full um, potential, we need to be able to have, you um, uh, centralized data, because on top of that data is the AI and ML. And if you want self-service and personalization, you're going to have to have um, strong centralized data. And you're going to have to have a strong data um, strategy in order to pull that off, because it's frankly, it's like a lot of junk and it's all it's all duct taped together with legacy systems. And it's just when you find out what's going on under the hood in a lot of these healthcare organizations, and they know it too, they know they have data problems. And that's why uh, I wrote an article on this. It's on LinkedIn, but that's why they're focusing on all of the major healthcare organizations, all the major payers and all the major uh, health systems. They've gone to Google, they've gone to IBM, they've gone to Amazon. And, uh, and uh, I know I'm missing one, Google, IBM, Amazon, what's, which one am I missing? Uh, anyway, they've gone to the top four uh, places to, to put, to, to house their data. And that data are on servers, you know, mostly in the United States. I mean, there's redundancies, but when you think about all of our personal healthcare data and just, and this has just happened in the last couple of years, they've all gone to, to these big, um, uh, you know, data uh, repositories and in the cloud, yeah. right? And all of a sudden, United Healthcare got hacked. It's one of the largest hacks in in the world, and it happened to the biggest payer. Then, right after it, Ascension got hacked. And Ascension just got hacked a, like a month or two ago, and that is the largest. Well, that's the largest payer and an insurance company and the largest nonprofit healthcare system in the world. Both mm -hmm. of them. And so when you think about, well, if they can get hacked and people can get our data, not just our credit card information, but they can find out, you know, about your, about the medications you're taking and, you know, ailments and things of your chronic conditions, things that, you know, only your doctor can see, that's pretty scary. And um, I think we need to, we really need to pay attention to having more security and, and ethics around how we're using AI and, and, and the things that we're doing as far as security measures. You know, given this thing that just happened with CrowdStrike, uh, there's th this stuff is happening all over the place, and this is a huge concern. Yeah, one of our one of our I totally agree. It's really scary. Uh, one of our speakers uh, for Amsterdam, yeah, Sigrid Bergen van, Roy van Royen, and I destroyed her name. I am so sorry, Sigrid, if you're watching this. She uh, the topic of her talk was actually what are all the regulations that are coming for data in healthcare and AI in Europe and how, and she said something that really stuck with me is that if we don't have a mechanism to get insights, data is worth nothing. Right. And, and I it's all over the place and it's not talking to one another. You're really not doing your patients or your, your the members uh, of any system, any favors, right. Yeah. Or right. anybody. And no, the healthcare system has changed so much, even before like, 
sometimes I hear people that AI is like the biggest like change, but I, but I'm reading a book right now called Strangers to Ourselves, which is about mental health and how people with schizophrenia were treated and before like they were antidepressants because they were antipsychotics like how uh, and then I read this other book about how medicine had health had developed for women it's wild it's wild like how health like I know that everything has developed in a massive the high right. stuff but how healthcare has like that's why I that's why I love it that's why I'm so into it so I find it so fascinating because it's on one side a very legacy based slow moving beast but on the other side, when it changes, it changes in a massive way. And it kind of impacts so much, so many people. So that's why I got right. into it. Like, why did why did you get into healthcare? That's a major reason. I'll tell you, I'll tell you how I got into it, and then I'll tell you why I stayed. How does that sound? <laughs> so Very important. Yeah. How I initially got into healthcare was 25 years ago, I started recruiting. Uh, with specialized, what they called it back then, it was specialized communications or internal communications and recruitment, branding and advertising, employment branding. But now it's just called employee experience. Mm -hmm. And so what I did is I had to figure out how to recruit during one of the most um, uh, difficult times in healthcare, like the early 2000s in healthcare in the United States of America, there's a massive, there's still a shortage of healthcare workers, right? There's a shortage of people going into pediatrics. That's that's a big deal here. And the other thing is there's a shortage of, of allied health, which are those ancillary workers, the people who empty bedpans and check monitors and things like that and make 15, mm -hmm. 18, $20 an hour. So there's a, there's a shortage of them and there's a shortage of nurses. But 20 years ago, the shortage of nurses was really, really bad. And I mean, they only made 40 or 50 K a year. And one of the things that all of these big systems were doing was, was basically pilfering uh, each other's workers. And what we were doing is from every system was trying to get the other systems nurses and they were giving them these ridiculous sign-on bonuses and like really high sign-on bonuses. And what was happening is nurses were just jumping ship, going and working somewhere for a year and then jumping back and getting paid, coming and going. They were getting, you know, 10, eight, $10,000 bonuses every time they did it. And so they're, it got to be, I don't know if you remember this or if you ever heard about this, but in the 90s, the all of the all of the long distance carriers were doing this. This is before like mobile carriers got strong. And the mobile, the the long distance carriers were buying customers from one another. And it got out of control. And so I was in the middle of that with healthcare. And um I had to recruit women from the you mentioned women uh from the United Arab Emirates, mostly nurses. And back then. Um, the majority of nurses, like 90 something percent, 94 percent were female. Now it's more like 80. Um, so it's, you know, it's changing. There's more men and because it became, you know, a little bit more socially acceptable to see men as nurses. And um, I had to recruit from like the United Arab Emirates. I had to recruit from Mexico. I had to recruit in six, seven, eight different languages. And you're thinking, oh, that sounds fun. But there's some stuff that you can say to American women about, hey, come work over here or, hey, we've got good, good, good jobs and, and great benefits. There's all kinds of stuff that you can say, but you cannot say those things in the UAE. You cannot say those things in the Middle East. There's a certain way you have to talk to women. And the bottom line is uh, learning all of that. Building uh, intranets, I, I built really large intranets for a couple of the largest uh, systems um, and uh, and uh, being able to do lots of different types of ad units, like meaning how do we how do we target them marketing wise? Like we started getting into that CX type stuff, you know, like customer experience. How do we how do we um, market and brand these things and and how do we recruit people from online? And this was back when you had skyscraper ads and jumbo ads. You had these ads all over the internet. That we still have them, but they're on junky websites, right? Like really nice websites. They don't put them everywhere, and it's not on the whole right side and the top and in the middle. You know, the, they they had different 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 kind of um, rules for what was tacky and what was okay back then. <laughs> Uh, but that's how I kind of got into um, healthcare, and I, I was fortunate enough to be in Houston, Texas, which is where the world-renowned medical center is. And so I worked with all of those companies: uh, Tenet, HCA, Memorial Hermann, 
UTMB, St. Luke's, those are all the biggest hospitals for everything from, you know, cancer to research to you name it. And, um, and I was thankful because I had those clients, meaning I was like the agency of record. We don't really say that much anymore because everything's kind of disparate. And we, we, we spread different aspects of experience around and agencies, consultants, lots of people do lots of things. But back then, they would sign on the dotted line with one person or one agency and you would get it all. You would get all of that work. So I was doing TV spots, radio. I was doing all of their websites. I was doing uh, micro sites. I was doing uh, online career fairs and all sorts of stuff. And so I got excited about that because it, it felt good um, helping uh, uh, nurses and, 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 and healthcare workers find work. And that felt like good, you know, because I had done oil and gas, I had done fashion, I had done all sorts of things. I really was like, eh, I don't really want to do that anymore. Or I, or I don't want to do this because of my beliefs are changing, you know? And so I felt like I could stay in healthcare for a while and I really liked it. And plus healthcare is such a complex broken system and all the way around, you know, it doesn't matter if you're talking about the, the industry, um, the, 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 the payers, um, it doesn't matter if you're talking about the providers, the doctors, it doesn't matter if you're talking about, um, you know, the, the workers and, and it, th there's just so much going on there and there's so much nuance and like, there's hundreds and hundreds of acronyms you have to remember. And I don't remember any of them all the time. I'm always asking people like, what does that acronym mean again? Because I know I remember it. Um, but Learning all of that stuff now more than ever, what we're seeing in recruitment within the design and research service design community is recruiters and hiring managers, they want that purple squirrel. The purple squirrel is that perfect person for the gig, right? It's the unicorn. Um, and so they don't want to hire people from fintech or from, uh, you know, retail to come into uh, healthcare. They want healthcare people and people that know about healthcare. And there's a lot of startups that are that are popping up that are, um, some of them are good and some of them are not so good. And last year we saw a bunch of them fold fold up and close their doors. Um, just, it, it was uh, it was pretty wild last year how many uh, healthcare startups got shut down. But I, I just really got passionate and excited about solving problems for people um, I started doing a lot more of the research in the service design as opposed to being like a, um, you know, the, a, a digital design director. I started doing a lot more of the of the um, the initial problem uh, identification, problem definition and opportunity sizing. I started doing a lot more of that. So initial discovery and findings about like what problem to go solve so that I could tell the business and product people what to go build. And once I started doing that, a lot more. I really fell in love with the, that work a lot. And so that's really what's what's um, enabled me to stay is I've done a lot of things in this business that I've never, you couldn't do in other businesses. I have journey maps. I have blueprints wherein the person at the end of the journey map dies. They lose their life. I have cried on a call with people that were losing their life. They were, they were dying and they knew they were dying. I have uh, almost like forged relationships, doing longitudinal studies on people, checking in with them every month while they were going through cancer treatment. And the 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 second to the last time I spoke to the person, I was um uh they they were basically they had they had a positive um uh kind of uplifting um demeanor and they were thinking you know I'm just gonna fight this and I'm gonna fight it you know with my with what, with all my heart, my, my, um, entire, my, my body, my spirit, and I'm going to win this. And I'm like, okay, great. And I get off the call. And then the next time, um, I speak to them as an email and they're just like, yeah, I got a lot of bad news from my last checkup. And this is, this doesn't look good. And then they didn't show up for the final interview and they didn't show up because they died. And so that's happened to me a bunch of times, so, so, something like that. That's happened to me. Things, other things that have happened to me are like I get on a call and I think I'm about to speak to a person about services and it and, and what and what's going on with them um, receiving care. And two people are on the call and I'm expecting to speak to one. And then I find out that the person in the call is deaf and that their mother is speaking for them. And so, but he can read lips and he's reading my lips and I'm telling him that my 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 stepsister was deaf. 
and I'm sharing all these things with him, they're having a difficult time finding some place that takes the insurance that we take. And I'm a human centered designer and a human uh, or a service designer doing service design work. And this person can't find care. So I take, I stop the, when I'm done with the call, I stop my day and I go and I find the place for this person to, to go um, receive care locally where they were. They were in Florida and I was in Texas at the time. And so I've done a lot of things like that. that are just not customary and things you don't do. And in fact, most researchers, especially in healthcare would tell you, don't make any promises. Don't, cry with them, don't commiserate, you know what I mean? Don't do any of the things that I just said, that that's all bad interviewing, but I beg to differ. And it's made the difference. Um, and it's why I've been so passionate about staying is I feel like I can wake up every day and I can make a difference. And sometimes when I'm in a, a, a large organization, I'm, I'm in one right now, solving a very large problem for them. And I'm doing it solo. I'm not on a team. I'm working with different teams, but I'm just sort of a floater. And um, it's it's rewarding to know that you're going to solve a problem and millions of people in multiple states are going to be affected. You know what I mean? When you can say, I'm going to solve this $40, $50 million problem, and it's going to affect how people in 20 different states receive care. You know what I mean? Uh, in, in, or you can affect some change and people can find and, and price their care and get what it is that they're looking for, whereas they couldn't before because some mobile experience or web experience was broken. And um, that's just what's kept me passionate. I know I kind of rambled there for a minute, but that's what's kept me excited about staying in healthcare, all that kind of stuff. You, I, you know what? I you, What you once told me that in healthcare, it's a lot about the passion. And that's something that we see in the UX conference that it's, it's the passion why people stay in the field, that it's more, right. I, I, I saw this interview a little while back. It was talking about the similarities between customer experience and patient experience. Right. And it had a lot of valid points, but what I, but what I also stated is that a customer and a patient don't have similar, like they have similarities, but a customer rarely has the emotional weight that a patient is going to have. It's, for example, if you're talking about customers, somebody, let's say somebody buying a casket or doing funeral arrangements for a person that just died. Yes, there's an emotional weight to that. But in, for example, if you're saying a customer in retail, they don't have the emotional strain that right. a patient has. I, I remember in one, in one scenario I was doing, um, I was doing, I was doing a medical market research project doing analyzing interviews and it was about hemophilia and right. There were a lot of hard lifting stories like this woman saying that she adopted a, a little uh, a little boy from China when like what the situation in hemophilia is in China compared to the US and how he came in a wheelchair and because of a medication that is available in the US and not in China, he could walk within a year and do sports and be amazing. And on the other side, there were other talks. It was um, a man who was now in his 40s, but was HIV positive because he got plasma in the 80s before they started screening for right. in, in factor eight. So there's all those stories and that's what really keeps you, or at least keeps me and keeps us like engaged. It's like the possibility of making impact in people's lives at a massive scale or an in incredible degree. And it's it's caring. And I agree with you. It's like, it's, it's like when they say like, don't care. It's like, how am I not gonna care? It's a human being for God's sakes. Right. And that's, that's a, you know, I'm going to sound a little mushy, you know, here talking about this, but that's why I think that healthcare workers are a completely different breed. And we were talking about that purple squirrel thing a second ago and, and how recruiters are looking for people with a healthcare background. I see all of the time, um, you know, people talking about, you know, nomenclature, they're talking about words and titling and things like that. And I always see this sarcastic comment come up on LinkedIn at least once a week. And it's, what is this human centered design or human centered service design? Aren't we all designing for humans? And the answer to that is no. And how can you be so stupid? Like some of us are designing straight for, straight for profit. Some of us don't really care about humans at all. We care about money. And the thing is, is the thing the thing about healthcare workers that you can say that that um they're in it for the right reasons and that's why i encourage people when people ask me like who should go into healthcare and how should they do that 
I say, check yourself, check yourself before you go, because this is not where you get big awards. This is not where you get your name and lights. This is not where you get giant lofty uh, fang level salaries. This is where you save people's lives and they pay you garbage money to do it. And it's grueling, but it is the most rewarding thing in the world to know that you're affecting giant broken systems. And we, we talk a lot in service design and we talk a lot in design period about systems thinking and systems design. And I don't think there's a more broken system on planet Earth than healthcare and how we treat humans. Yeah, no, you're totally correct. And that is, it's a real shame and it's it's destructive and the level at which if we don't, if you're not going to care about people, then what is the, what is the point in the, re, in the results? Your point. It just, yeah. Is so we have talked a lot about the value of working in healthcare, but let's talk a little bit about the challenges because like we said before, it's a big, massive beast with a lot of legacy systems, but what else is it? Uh, something that we heard a lot in the, in the conference and, and that I, that I hear a lot in the space is that sometimes getting taken seriously as a designer, it's pretty rough. It can be pretty challenging. Have you experienced that or what have been your challenges? I don't know. I've, uh, I've received, I, I probably have had a much harder time in startups that were not healthcare related than ones, uh, than, than working in healthcare. And I think it's really critical, like we mentioned before, that if you have a background in this space and you kind of understand some things, there's some, um, you can provide a lot of value if you can shift and pivot really quick and you're able to get in and, and um and and do your best to inform uh, whatever uh, solutioning or innovation or whatever it is that you're doing right um, with with valuable insights. If once once you build some rapport and some trust, people start to really look at you like you know you're you're a, an integral part of the process, and they start to rely on you a little bit more. But I think what's really important is understanding the difference between the UK and US too, right? Because I know that you're doing you're you're doing this uh, you're doing this uh, UX event in in Germany, um, but there's a difference. Like in UK, the 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 funding for healthcare comes from taxes, right? And from us, it's it's private insurance and public programs. And those public public programs are like Medicare and Medicaid, and um, you know the coverage in the UK is universal. Ours is not universal. Um, believe it or not, the majority of healthcare workers and especially people that are doing the design and research and, you know, responsible for innovation within healthcare, or at least just keeping the lights on. Um, we, we all believe in universal healthcare and we want like either a single payer or a universal healthcare experience. It's the payers that can afford lo lobbyists to go um, get laws made that they don't want it, of course, because that will dip into how much money they make. And so you, you, the cost in the UK is, is lower per capita than the US um, and ours is much higher, right? And so um, you, your, your access, your point of access to, to healthcare, it's free at the point of use. And you have some exceptions, but it's free mostly. And ours de depends on the insurance coverage and it depends on the insurance company and whatever um, product you purchased. As far as when I say product, I mean service. I mean uh, uh, what, whatever kind of um, coverage you got when you when you signed up for it. And mm -hmm. our two biggest is employer and um, Medicare. Right? Those are those are those are the two most profitable that come from us being in a um, capitalist uh, in, environment and system and uh, in a free market system. And so the outcomes in the UK are, are generally mostly better in some regards. And mm -hmm. um, what, I, what I noticed when I went to Europe is there's a lot of people that seem to relax a lot. They It seems like there's a lot of uh, eating and drinking in cafes for three or four hours at a time and sitting around and eating chocolates in Belgium and drinking beer and smoking Dunhills. And it's like, you just don't see stuff like that in, in the States. We're in and out of drive throughs We go into restaurants and we're rushing to the next thing. And that's bad for us. And we're eating a lot of foods that are bad for us. And one of the things that, you know, you have to do when I mentioned previously about, you know, the Medicare and Medicaid being, being, being um, one of the largest uh, things that we provide in large payers is 
there, there's a, there, we have a thing called the STARS ratings and it's from the CMS and CMS is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they measure um, the, the member experience, if, whether or not patients and members, if they're taking their medications, so that's called RX adherence. So just adherence to taking your, your, your meds regimen mm -hmm. and staying healthy and, you know, what we're doing about chronic conditions and, um, you know, different aspects of, 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 of customer service and about understanding the plans. And if you get, it's a five-star rating. And if you get three stars and two stars more than one or two years in a row, they, they will, they, they can remove your ability and your, your privileges to, to sell Medicare and Medicaid to people and dual eligibility folks, people who straddle between both of them, they're called D SNP. Mm -hmm. And so, um, understanding that is really critical because we have, like I said, you guys are taking care of yourselves a little bit better. You're being, you're being very, you have a lot of watchdog groups over there about what you can or can't put in food. Whereas mm -hmm. over here, you know, the FDA, um, you know, the, the food and drug administration and a lot of other, there's a lot of other groups. They're letting things in our food that aren't good for us. And they believe we're causing lots of different issues and gut issues and um, I think that's really important. It's also really important that the UK should do some type of social determinants of health because it's probably going to be different over there. But the social determinants of health have been determined um, based on your economic stability, how much money you have, what what kind of environment are you are you in your neighbor, what's your neighborhood and your 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 familial. Uh, environment. What does that look like? What's your level of education and quality? That's another thing that's a huge deal in American healthcare. Whenever I see so-called design leaders say that healthcare is not about educating people more or giving people better education, I 100% beg to differ. That's false. Um, I've interviewed so many people and everyone who's done this work legitimately anywhere will tell you a massive part of why people are unhealthy and sick and dying is because of their education level and what they think about their health. I have done exhaustive research in diabetes and type 2 diabetes, and I'm telling you the majority of those people were dying. They were they had already lost their spouse, lost their brother or sister. They're losing their parents all to diabetes mm -hmm. and they're in the South and they're asking me things about, well, can I just take some homeopathic stuff? Like, uh, you know, can I take some, you know, some, some, uh, you know, like Chinese medicine and fix this? Like, why do I need to take metformin and why do I need to get insulin shots? And so they go off their meds and they have some kind of episode. They pass out while they're driving in the car or worse. Um, it's why we make people who have Medicare and Medicaid, we make them go annually to get eye exams. And why? Because the majority of people who get uh, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, if they have insurance, they learn from an eye exam. And a lot of people don't know this. They, that's how you, it, you don't just waddle into the doctor, you know, as, you know, a 300 pounder at five foot six and say, hey, what's wrong with me? It, what happens is they go to get, they go to get their eyes examined mm -hmm. and they realize they have diabetes. Some of these people, it's in their family. It's a, a, everyone. If you grow up in the South, in the United States of America, or Hispanic families, you know as well as I do, the way we eat is everything, right? It's 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 a family gathering. You're supposed to eat lots of bread, lots of cheese, lots of sugar, lots of alcohol, <laughs> and all of those things equate to poor health outcomes. And you know, we need to be able to we need to be able to educate people about that kind of stuff and let them know culturally that there are certain things that you can and can't eat. And maybe you grew up eating, maybe you grew up eating heavy like that because you worked outside for 12 hours a day. But if you sit in front of a computer and you eat pizza and cheeseburgers, I can promise you, you're going to be overweight and you're going to be sick and in, 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 in the hospital by the time you're in your 40s or 50s. You're going to have issues. Yeah, it's it's really it's really interesting because it's a conversation that we have very, that we have very often say in, I think it's, has a lot to do with privilege it's like do you right. have access um yeah. do you have access or something like oh pe like uh kids are spending too much time in inside they're spending in time outside. Right. and every time that i that i see that i say like okay what is their outside what does their outside look like right or um is it dangerous are they are they in the middle of dangerous? a, a war-torn ghetto because inside playing video games might be the safest place but, that, might, their, that their mom or dad wants them yeah 
Exactly. Right. Or is it can they or oh they're not good like eating like home cooked meals? It's like when you have two working parents, home cooked meals are usually not an option. They if they're working shift jobs, which are usually like it's it's this idea, it's like people are not people with low income are not healthy because they don't want to. It's like when when you set the bar for healthy so expensive, it's not possible. Yeah. It's just right. not or like, oh, you should grow your own food. Where? Yeah. Can you do that if you live in a if you live in a a, a single room uh, apartment and you're living with a one parent, your mom, and she's working two jobs to make sure that you have clothes on your back and food in the refrigerator? Yeah. Yep. Or um, that's that, how like, I grew up. <laughs> yeah, it it and, and it is what it is. It's like we're we're not spending like for example, I grew up in a place that I could I like I we in Latin America like used to live in a citadel. It's like oh, why didn't you take your your bike to go to school? It's like. Or I was I was having this conversation with a friend because I live in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, in the Netherlands, we bike everywhere, and people say, "Oh, with if everybody around the world biked, uh, then we wouldn't have climate change anymore." And I'm like, "Okay, so if I I bike to the gym every morning, and I would say the distance about like two point five kilometers, if I bike that in my home city, I'm either getting robbed, I'm getting hit by a car and left for dead, or I'm getting raped. I'm it's, right. it's one of those three options." None of them are nice. So secure for safety reasons, you have to use a car. Right. It, it is, can you imagine living in central Texas or South South Texas or Mexico and riding a bicycle? It gets 112 degrees exactly. here for three months out of the year. You're not riding your bicycle anywhere. You're going to be sitting inside on next to an AC or a fan. <laughs> yeah. It, and, it, and it's those challenges this, that looking at the social determinants of health as well. It's like, oh, like, that person should just go on a jog. Do they live in a neighborhood where it's safe enough to for them to go on a jog? Do they have or or what you were mentioning, like with with families, like especially with food? Food is more than just nutrition, it's a social activity. Right. So when you're telling somebody you are now gonna be on this restricted diet, you cannot sit down at the table eating with your family. Right. You're forgetting that social socialization and community is part of you. So you're you're blocking one of the social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. which is social behavior and community by telling right. them you have to do this. It's there's a reason why addicts don't recover if they go back to the same environment in which they, that caused their addiction. Right. And food and food is an addiction for many. And when people make fun of people for being overweight or they make fun of them for eating a certain kind of way, you don't realize that a lot of people deal with trauma with food. The people who don't do drugs and don't drink alcohol or don't, you know, gamble or aren't addicted to Internet porn, they're addicted to food. And yep. a lot of the people who have uh, been um, harmed as children or had a, you know, a, a violent upbringing or um, they've lived through some some serious issues and have and PTSD. A comfort. And that's a comfort thing. And so the idea that we make fun of people who are obese and and we pretend like it's just them overeating um, and there's not something much deeper and 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 more in need of compassion uh that's going on there that's a little bit that's a little bit disheartening and kind of sad and short-sighted to think and talk like that and it's what it does is it it gives way and it gives people permission to be to be disrespectful and biased and bigoted towards people that don't look like them yeah that that short and i think that that you held in your head with that it's short-sighted it's you're not looking which is always also oh why this person that like, stays in the mid-level job or why not go for a promotion or why do they not right. go for like for for example saying like oh why doesn't this person just go to school if they want to have a better job you don't know what their situation is you right. don't you can't afford it you don't know what what side of what other responses that's why i hate those motivational speakers that go on and say like oh if you cannot do it it's because you don't want to you don't know right. their life right. you don't know their life Right. And you, you can't solve any major issue with regards to humans, especially when we start talking about health and behavior and psychology. You can't you can't solve anything with apathy. Mm -hmm. And so this is why we 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 double down in the healthcare industry, um, talking about things like empathy and dignity and respect. And the reason is it's just so there's a lot going on in the design community right now and not as much in Europe, but in America, there's this big backlash towards 
uh, design thinking. And there's a lot of people who aren't very good at their jobs and they're not very intelligent. And they're saying things like empathy is related to design thinking and empathy isn't science. When you hear people talk like this, trust me, don't ever hire them. Don't. Yeah. Because they're, I don't know that they're, that they're, um, that they're teachable. I, 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 it's, it's like, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's there's almost, some pretty big there's some pretty big names in the design community and they're not bright, man. And the funny thing is, is they're either not working or they're they They got a job from their buddy and they were unemployed for two years. And if they lose this job, they're not going to work anymore. And they're saying these things online and it's quite destructive. I actually know some design leaders in healthcare as well. I wouldn't consider them my peers because they're not very educated and they're not very smart. And I'm not being mean because I'm not naming names, but mm -hmm. they'll say things online. They'll say things online online like you know healthcare isn't about education it's not about educating people and it's like come on man seriously i, I, like how, I long, how long have you done this you know i saw one of the i saw one of those leaders saying um the, the benefits of dark patterns it's like are you are are you saying that because they're saying like oh we don't need education we just need to trick people into doing the right thing i'm, I'm hugely paraphrasing and summarizing but then i thought right. okay so you're you don't care about so you say that you know about behavioral design, but you're saying behavioral design, go to garbage. We just have to trick people into doing the right thing. So that's the most condescending thing I had ever read. On I, 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 I hate those kind of conversations too. Uh, one of my friends and someone I like a lot, and he's by you, he's in the Netherlands. I think he's in, man, he's going to get mad at me because I forgot. Oh yeah. He's in, um, he's in Amsterdam mm -hmm. and he, his name is Robert Meza. Mm-hmm. Do you oh, follow yeah. Robert? Yeah. You should follow him. He's Behaviors, really smart. yeah. Behavioral he's design really, guy. He's a behavioral design guy. And often he and I go back and forth, like sometimes on his threads, talking about like behavioral modification and about nudging and things like this. And there's a fine line between helping people or guiding them or giving them a little bit of a, you know, guidance or being a Sherpa for them mm -hmm. and, or being uh, manipulative and doing, you know, um, manipulative patterns and dark patterns and tactics like that. The, the, the whole internet is split. And I find this funny when they all talk about Duolingo. That's mm -hmm. a, this is a great subject. Some people will rant and rave and say, Duolingo is so great. And the key to their growth is how they pester you and annoy you. Well, see, what I just did is I colored it with my experience. Yeah. Some people like that shit. I don't like it. I didn't, I tried to get on Duolingo and I couldn't stand it. It was annoying. And I just thought it was just you know the all the gaming and badging and all the pestering and oh so you don't want to learn spanish anymore right uh <laughs> it, so i don't really like those types of things and i there's much worse and i've done much worse mm -hmm. um but when i see that kind of stuff in healthcare i call it out yeah no especially because in like it's one thing being like okay i'm gonna nudge you to learn a language and you can stop and your survival is not depending on this but then when you're nudging people, it, like, I think that the, a huge key of it is ethics, that when you're designing in healthcare, you need to like very, very clear about your values and what are the values of the others and why are be very critical of how okay. you're doing things and identify where is that line. Be in, and especially now in the US with like everything that's going on, like with over like overturning Roe Ro v. Wade and everything that's going to happen. Right. With, it, like as a result of the election, it's going to be even more important to create those safeguards to be like, right. okay, these are the things that we're not going to do anymore. And knowing that every decision that you make is going to have a consequence on a human being, and it's not going to be a consequence on their uh, shopping experience. It's not going to be a consequence on how easy do they uh, do they get to their homework with ChatGPT. It's going to be a consequence on whether or not they're going to get access to the medication, whether or not they're going to be able to support the person they're supporting with their caregivers, or whether or not they're going to need you for their next call with you and what's going to happen next. So it's a huge level of responsibility. And yeah, I think like you said in the beginning, it's like check your, if you want to get into the field, you need to check yourself first and be like, check what is the motivation to be here? Search yourself. Because the thing is, this is another thing. This is no, another goofy trope or meme uh, that you're going to see a lot on uh online is you you hear people saying you know what is this with researchers and designers thinking they're standing in the gap 
between the business and the and the user. You need to work for the business. Well, I beg to differ. Of course, we need to make sure everybody gets their needs met in the system. That's part of service design, right? Mm -hmm. But when, when the company that you're doing is doing something evil or nefarious, when they're denying claims with AI, when they're when they're intentionally when they know that you're dealing with something that is a serious chronic illness or it is a deadly uh, illness and there's a high degree of fatality in the certain type of cancer you have and they just deny you and deny you and deny you and without even looking at your case and they're just auto denying you with a bot that is evil and companies are doing that right now so when people talk like that and they sound apathetic and sarcastic and condescending about you know design and what it is that our job is our our job is to serve humanity and the bottom line is um, if you're getting into this business for any other reason other than the fact that you love human beings and you want to see them have good health outcomes and you want you want to help, you know, um, then you're I think you're getting into it for the wrong reasons because this isn't flashy and it's not cool and it's sad. And I promise I don't care what kind of tough guy or cool person you are. You, if you don't cry at least once every six months doing your job in healthcare, when you hear something, you don't get chills on the back of your neck. You're not, you're not a, a righteous soul, in my opinion. You know what I mean? You probably should go into another business because there's a lot of really brutal, dark things and truths and things that we learn about ourselves and about us as humans and our bias. And, you know, you mentioned a second ago about, you mentioned, um, you know, you know, women's health. And that's one of my big issues is I don't want to hear women specifically say that women's health is a is a woman's issue i don't want to hear them say the abortion problem or or or, or, or the 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 idea of choice is a, a a woman's issue it isn't it's a human rights issue and it's up to men to stand in the gap and support women in, in this fight and the thing is when you say it's solely a woman's issue what you're doing is you're giving men that are on the fence or don't know much or they're kind of ignorant you're giving them permission to look away and not help yeah Totally. I'm, I'm, I mean, like one of the one of the communities that I'm part of it, like uh, the Healthcare Business Women Association, which is a global association. And one of the things that we talk about a lot is like, how do we bring in allies? Like, how do we bring in men as well? Because when you start saying like, oh, this is just like it, it applies to everything. So like, oh, this is an immigrant issue. Oh, this is a political issue. Oh, this is a men's right. issue. Women's issue. You're, it, it's we're all connected. And I think that's one that's one of the things that you learn when you do service design. And when you do like user experience, it's like everything is connected. Everything is right. connected at some point. And I think like to to close, because my last question was going to be like, what recommendations would you give somebody who wants to enter healthcare in as a designer? I would say be aware of how connected we are. Like read about like system, systemic, like Donella Meadows, like Donella Meadows, like the highest um, on systemic thinking, because that's when you see like how everything is connected and how every decision that we make is going to affect somebody else so how important it is to listen to the people who are being affected by the issue directly and to not just say like oh i'm listening to all my stakeholders it's like yeah okay i, I had a conversation with um with a startup who, uh, um it's a startup in the diabetes field and they're creating like a little diabetes monitor it's going to be more practical and everything and I was saying like, oh, how, like I want to learn more about like how you do with your stakeholders for a talk that I'm going to give. And they're like, yeah, we talk a lot to our stakeholders, like our payers, our manufacturers and so on. And I was like, but isn't your biggest stakeholder the person who's going to wear the device? <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, we're in our cycle clinical trials. It's like, yeah, but how often do you talk to right. patients or like actual wearers or carers? It's like, oh, I'm wearing one right now. And I'm like, it's great that you're wearing one. but have you spoken to other people who have maybe a different physiognomy, who have different needs, who have different challenges, maybe somebody who is not the most technically savvy person? Like, uh, like who are your users? Who are you, have you actually spoken to and have a conversation with? And I think it's that need to keep distance. It's like, oh, if I get too close, I'm not going to be objective anymore. It's like, you right. have to get close. You have to be willing yeah. to get close and personal. You have to, you have to, you have to involve them. You can't just go off in a, in a lab and design for people. You have to design with them. That's what human centered design is all about. 
That's, you know what I mean? What you're talking about when people just go build stuff, this is why most projects and fail and most products fail is they don't invest the time and energy to do that opportunity and that problem kind of uh, identification and definition and sizing. They don't do that first. So they go build the wrong thing. They go solve a problem that doesn't exist. And they, they're trying to think of, oh, well, we got this piece of technology. How can we make money on it? Instead of what are the real problems that are happening in the world and the community? And how do we how do we create this thing that's going to solve those a real problem that no one else is solving? Or if they're doing it, they're not doing a good job of it. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. Like, why is it? And then uh, and then instead of saying like, oh, it's because like our technology is not good enough. It's like, are you? What is the problem that you're trying to solve here? Right. What is it? Because right. if you don't understand, also fall in love with the problem. And also because the problem is so in healthcare, they're so massive. It's not going to be a quick fix. It's never going to be a quick fix. Like that's, that's the last thing that we should probably, that I should probably bring home is what you just mentioned. Cause this is, that's real important. When you solve a big problem in healthcare, you're solving a problem for millions of people, mm -hmm. sometimes billions. It just depends on what country you're in and what kind of weight it has. But like if you were to work for the NHS in the UK, you'll be solving problems for a lot of people, for you know tens of millions of people. And uh, when, when you do something and you have some kind of new innovation or some type of new solution for something that's broken. And I think that that's one of the most rewarding aspects, right? If you go work for some mom and pop shop or you go work for some, if you go work for TikTok, you're not really doing that, you know what I mean? <laughs> If you're working for TikTok, that's not true. But I think that's a great that's a great way to like bring it home. So Thomas, before before we before we head out, I know you gave some shout outs uh in that earlier on our talk, and I will add them to the and I will definitely add them to the final for the final post when we like add this like to to link them up. But are there any resources or any other people on LinkedIn or books that you would like to re recommend people if they want to learn more about the field? Yeah, there's a lot of service design books out there that are excellent. Um, uh, you know, Adam St. John Lawrence and Mark Stickdorn, they wrote the Bible on, uh, you know, this is service design doing. Um, they, they wrote a they, they wrote three books and one of them's amazing. The other two are good. Um, but I, follow people that are smart. Follow people that really care about this stuff. I like um, there. There's a service design, um, a service designer, and a strategist from Boston, and her name is Jen Braselli. I love her. I think she's really smart. She's she's she. I would say she's got like a heavy science background, and that's kind of like why I like reading some of her stuff. Um, there's lots of other people. There's um there's a uh, Amy Hamans. She uh, was the founder of Mad Pal. She worked at United Healthcare. And she started a new company called Beneficent, and they're doing a lot in healthcare and service design. Um, uh, who else? Um, Lindsay Mosby. She she's a really cool person to know. Um, and there's a lot of great service designers in, in in healthcare. But follow people who are passionate about it and they're lifers, meaning they're not just dipping their toes in and they're not doing healthcare for a minute. It's what they're going to do for the rest of their career. Mm -hmm. And if you follow people like that, you're going to learn a lot more than these people who just came to the space in the last year or two or a couple of years. And uh, there's that. Yeah, sounds great. I'll definitely add them. So thank you so much, Thomas, for your time has been really insightful. I love talking, like, you know that I love talking to you and I feel people who would love hearing from you. So thank you so much. You're so sweet. Thank you so much. Have a good day and we'll talk again on LinkedIn. Yes, see you there. Take care. Take care.